world will note that the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, a military base. We won the race of discovery against the Germans. We have used it in order to shorten the agony of war, in order to save the lives of thousands and thousands of young Americans. Frank, it was an accident at the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant. A cooling pump broke down, and the plant did just what it was supposed to do, shut itself off. But not before some radioactivity had escaped. Fires triggered by Friday's quake are burning out of control up and down the coast, including this one at an oil refinery in Ichihara. A fire was also reported at a turbine building at a nuclear power plant. Authorities say no radiation has leaked. Around 200,000 people who live near the Fukushima nuclear power plant have been evacuated as a precaution. Authorities claim so far just a few have tested positive but showed no health problems. in excess of what the government uh, says is are the minimum amount, amount right. you should be exposed to are actually good for you and reduce cases of cancer. <laughs> of radiation what kind of payback is this the worst nuclear disaster in human history is chernobyl the un says 4,000 people died because of that that's the i hate nukes people that have adjusted that number Stu, what are the confirmed dead in from chernobyl was it 40 there there is really zero chance that any radiation is going to move uh, out of uh, even if the outer containment structure exploded and moved from japan to the united states and create any health problem whatsoever california republican congressman devin nunez wants to see 200 new reactors built um Congressman, that's going to be a tough sell these days. How do you think it's going to go? My hope and my prayer is that everything ends up okay uh, over time and people realize that nuclear power is the way to go ultimately.
when Dwight Eisenhower became president in September 1953, he went to the UN and gave what has become known as the Atoms for Peace speech. And in it, Eisenhower acknowledged that nuclear weapons are a terrible threat to humanity. But in addition, the atom can be used for peaceful purposes, medical purposes, and also to generate electricity. The United States pledges before you, and therefore before the world, its determination to help solve the fearful atomic dilemma, to devote its entire heart and mind to find the way by which the miraculous inventiveness of man shall not be dedicated to his death, but consecrated to his life. While we can and do produce electricity using nuclear reactors, there were three questions back then that were unanswered. Can we guarantee that there will not be a major accident and a meltdown of a reactor? Is there a guarantee that the low-level radiations that come out of these reactors are harmless? Do we have a way to deal with deadly nuclear waste? The answers to all these questions is unequivocally no. Fifty years ago, those questions were unanswered, and today they are still unanswered. As nuclear technology proliferates around the world, we see just how devastating this technology is. Uh, the destruction's widespread. We know that 200 people have been washed away with buildings, cars and ships all swept uh, by those waters. Well, the uh, uh, ramifications are widespread. The uh, efforts today to uh, put uh, cold water on the reactors has failed. This area could be deadly for many years to come. In Fukushima, we have six reactors there, total chaos. Any monitoring that's been done is completely random and unreliable. We know there's been a breach of, of Unit 3 at Fukushima, where there is plutonium. Plutonium going into the atmosphere is about the worst thing imaginable. The tiniest grain of plutonium can cause lung cancer if breathed in. It is an alpha emitter and will damage the tissues to the extent that cancer is a virtual certainty. It's commonly said by the defendants of nuclear power that the nuclear power stations in America could not possibly suffer the sorts of accidents that were suffered by Chernobyl or Fukushima. Although, in fact, it's, it, it's well known that the Fukushima plants are exactly the same as many of the boiling water reactors that are currently in the United States and, they, and suffers from the same faults. The, uh, the main one being that the fuel rods are actually stored above the reactor. And anyone who's seen the picture of those destroyed uh, Fukushima reactors, particularly the very recent ones, photograph from a drone flying over the top of them, high resolution photographs, will see there's nothing left. There are no fuel ponds. There's just like a big black hole, which means that thousands of tons of fuel uh, elements, highly radioactive fuel elements, are just blown up in the sky. And then they go pitter patter, pitter patter all over the place. No one wants the spent fuel. Yes, we all know that there's no disposal of the nuclear rods. So there's no safe way of disposing of that stuff. Except maybe as we did in Japan at Fukushima, you put it on top of the reactor building, you blow up the reactor building, just blow crap into the air and breathe it in. That's one way of disposing it. He said, when reactor one blew up, we don't know where those rods are. We don't know how much is in the sky. We don't know how much will land in Chicago and Seattle and Buenos Aires, and it's going there. What we have at Fukushima Daiichi are three reactor cores in various stages of meltdown. And unit two has melted through the bottom of the reactor pressure vessel into a secondary containment building that was largely destroyed by a massive hydrogen detonation. But in addition, there are unit one and unit three reactor cores also melting down. They have not been able to restore cooling to those three reactor cores. They're pumping massive amounts of water into these buildings. And then that water becomes radioactively contaminated and then discharged into the ocean. In addition, there is the Unit 4 reactor storage pool for high-level radioactive waste that has boiled dry and the waste is caught on fire, directly releasing radioactivity into the environment. So in many ways, Fukushima Daiichi is an unprecedented nuclear catastrophe. 
The government allows uh, pro-nuclear scientists to go into the area in Fukushima and say outrageous things like 100 millisieverts of radiation a year is completely safe. The citizens are made to feel that if they are concerned, they're overreacting and they're ignorant and just overly nervous and that they shouldn't be. The Fukushima parents are so outraged that um, they went to Tokyo with soil that's contaminated, that is actually from the grounds of the uh, preschools and the elementary schools, and they brought that soil and they placed it in front of government officials at the Diet office building. And they said, this is the soil that our children are playing on, the toddlers sit on it, kids put dirt in their mouth, and this is the actual soil that we've put in front of you. They put the radiation monitor on it. The sound just went completely off. There are children now in Tokyo and south of the reactor and also in the northwest from the reactors showing signs of acute radiation illness. They're developing uh, very bad nosebleeds. They're developing vomiting and diarrhea. That's a classic symptom. They're classic symptoms of acute radiation illness when they've got a, had a massive dose of radiation. And forget not that children are 10 or 20 times more radiosensitive than adults, and fetuses thousands of times more so. We hear about mothers calling other people, weeping and crying, saying that they feel so guilty that they sent their child to school today and every day. And yet, uh, because there's no official evacuation, uh, if people leave the area and they leave their jobs, they will probably have no job to come back to. People have become very confused. We do know that Fukushima fallout has impacted the entire United States, and it's gone into the aquifer and it's gone into the ocean. If it gets into that aquifer system, that means you cannot decontaminate radiation from the drinking water, and yet the people of Japan are not being informed of this. Because then you're talking about having to evacuate, and evacuating a country like Japan is very, very difficult. There's absolutely no doubt that radiation has been coming to the United States from Fukushima since the accident began. It will continue to come here as radiation leaks uh, from, from these stricken reactors. It's essentially a tsunami of radiation that's still coming to the United States and will be coming for a long, long time. The Pacific Current goes north from Japan by uh, Alaska, comes down the coast of Canada and the United States. And it's gonna have effect on fish and plankton and whales and all sea life. For the President of the United States to get on national television and tell the American public not to worry about radiation coming from Fukushima is an abomination, a dereliction of duty that I consider to be the equivalent of murder. We see in Fukushima a plant which has supposedly been destroyed by an earthquake. The plant was supposed to be proofed to an 8-0 earthquake. There was no 9-0 earthquake at Fukushima. It's 110 miles from the epicenter. By the time it got to Fukushima, it was far less than 8 out that ground motion. The result is that the so-called safety of the plant was a lie. And from my experience, it was probably a deliberate lie. The American public is being constantly, relentlessly lied to about the true cost of atomic power, about the alleged inability of renewables to take their place, and certainly about the health impacts of Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, Fukushima, and God forbid, the next accident that is certain to come. The other end, of course, is the nuclear waste issue. What Fukushima has woken us up to is the fact that so much of the energy used in a nuclear reactor is to keep cooling the spent fuel. That basically means we have a negative energy system. We're going to, over the lifetime of the plutonium of 240,000 years, continue to have to cool this waste just to keep it as a livable component of our ecosystems. It is insane to split the atom to boil water. 
In Japan, this earthquake and tsunami, which knocked out 10 nuclear plants offline and six permanently, it would appear, uh, there are many, many windmills. These windmills uh, continue to operate throughout the earthquake. There was no slowdown in wind-generated electricity in Japan. They have plenty of wind power in Japan, plenty of geothermal. Uh, the Japanese solar industry has been in the vanguard for decades. It's in the absence of the alternatives that we are repeatedly told there is no alternative if to a clean nuclear. Nuclear is not clean because the dirt of nuclear is not the carbon dioxide, but the radiation. And Fukushima has shown us how dirty this technology can be. How many will die at Fukushima will never be known. We have never before faced the prospect of multiple meltdowns with deadly radioactive emissions beyond measure. Radiation in the veins, radiation under. My body is rebelling against uncalled invasion. What is not told and what is said in silence. Truth is unrevealed, uncovered about the invisible. The screams unheard, the unforgiven slavery, the accident occurred and we became the invisible. My name is Yelena Zmushko. I am from the contaminated zone of Chernobyl. On April 26, 1986, I was nine years old when the worst nuclear disaster at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant occurred. When I was young, I was not told the truth and I was too young to understand it. And now I am almost 30 and I want to find out the truth. I saw abandoned houses. Andrei Nikolaevich Cherkas died at the age of 23. Alexander Stanislavich Tishkevich died at the age of 18. The Oncological Center, which like other specialized hospitals, is located outside of capital of Belarus, Minsk, it looks like an asylum for the sick and is invisible to the public eye. The latest um, uh, epidemiological studies from Germany have estimated that the number of dead caused by Chernobyl, mostly through cancers, is approaching one million. It's a long, slow, deadly process. Some people say, well, where are the people who died at Chernobyl? We saw the pictures in Life magazine, the horrible pictures of the workers without hair that eventually had their immune system collapse and died within a matter of months. But you see, radiation is a silent killer. You carry this radiation with you in your bodies, in your blood, especially in your lungs. And when you start to die one by one, no one can say for sure that it was radiation. The industry is to the point now where its spokespeople are actually telling the public that atomic radiation is somehow good for you, which could not be more false. Uh, and so this is the kind of mentality we're dealing with. It's all cooked up in corporate boardrooms. This idea that nuclear power might be good for fighting global warming, I'm sure some PR flack came up with that, got a promotion and a bonus. Uh, this is all money driven. It's driven to uh, protect the huge investments in atomic energy. And we have a situation here where we have people power against money power. Chernobyl was very, very bad. We still don't know the results here, but I think it's overblown. All right, now for the record, no one died at Three Mile Island. In the Chernobyl disaster, approximately 31 people lost their lives because of direct radiation intrusion. Thousands of others are thought to have contracted cancer and died later on. I spoke with the Belarusian ambassador in London in uh, 1996, and he told me that, that, that they had an agreement with various people that they wouldn't publish any of the real data following the Chernobyl accident in exchange for uh, financial assistance. 
So we know that there has been a conspiracy and a cover-up of the effects of the Chernobyl accident. And I was involved in, uh, at Kiev. I went to a big international meeting at Kiev in 2001 in which we could see all of this happening. We had a lot of apparatchiks who were, who were sitting up uh, on the stage and saying that there is no effect following the Chernobyl accident, just a few liquidators have died. And people from the audience of the areas that were affected were standing up and screaming and saying, who told you to say these things? What lies? So there was a massive, massive uh, argument taking place. Professor Alexei Yablokov, who is uh, a member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, has examined many hundred, perhaps thousands of research papers that were published in the Russian language of studies that were carried out after Chernobyl into the health effects. And as a result of this research, he has concluded that the number of deaths produced by the radiation from the Chernobyl accident is just under one million deaths. And the research that I have done certainly suggests that the number is higher than that. But in fact, in the last 20 years, research has increasingly shown that there has been a massive health, health detriment as a result of the Chernobyl accident, showing that there was an increase in infant leukemia, children who were in the womb at the time of the Chernobyl fallout, from countries as far away as the United States, Greece, Belarus, England, Scotland, um, and Germany. 40% of the European landmass is still contaminated with radioactive materials and will be for the next uh, easily 600 years, but thousands of years. I don't eat European food because you don't know by eating food whether it's radioactive. So that gives you an indication of what they're still dealing with in Europe. There are wild hogs running around Germany getting into Berlin that are so radioactive they almost glow in the dark because the truffles that they eat and the mushrooms and the wild berries are chock-a-block full of cesium 137 The Chernobyl fallout impacted every bit of the Northern Hemisphere and caused enormous harm. Uh, thyroid disease went up markedly all over the world, but particularly in Belarus and around the, the area around Chernobyl, the childhood cancer rate, particularly from thyroid cancer, went up markedly. Birth defects went up. Leukemia increased, so it's had a devastating effect uh, on that country. Studies done in Germany as within three years after the Chernobyl um, blow up have found strontium-90 levels increased in the teeth of children there. We know what radiation does in the lab. We've seen what it does at Chernobyl, despite what they say otherwise, like the International Atomic Energy Agency, the World Health Organization. They don't recognize the health effects, but we know that they're there and we've seen it. And Dr. Yablokov's book shows it. A lot of other studies show it. So we know what it did at Chernobyl. I fear what it will do at Fukushima because of what happened at Chernobyl and what we've seen happen previously. We know what it did at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And we know what it does to people when they go in for cancer treatments, you might end up getting secondary cancers years down the road from the cancer treatment itself. So we know that it's capable of causing these problems. And since we know that, it is incumbent upon the industry to prove that it does not harm. It is not incumbent upon we as society or civil society or individuals to prove that it harms. It's up to the industry to prove that it is safe. We should use precaution and not expose people to this unnecessarily. And exposure unnecessarily is what the nuclear power industry does. There is no such thing as a safe level of radiation. In fact, one of the odd things I've heard is that we're constantly being told, for example, that, oh, the radiation from Three Mile Island, if you were within 10 miles, was the same as a lung x-ray that is the old-fashioned non-digital lung x-ray. Those lung x-rays killed an awful lot of people. It was an accident at the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant, which is located on an island in the Susquehanna River, 10 miles from Harrisburg. A cooling pump broke down, and the plant did just what it was supposed to do, shut itself off, but not before some radioactivity had escaped. The tragedy of Three Mile Island was, of course, that it did not 
explode in a visible way the way Chernobyl did. Then everyone would have been warned, people would have evacuated and so on. But instead it was a gradual, partly, part meltdown that didn't go all the way the way Chernobyl did. And as a result, radioactive gases came out, but not so instantly, and there was no fire to warn people. And as a result, the governor hesitated for a few days to order evacuation. I urged women and children to leave, but many didn't because you couldn't smell it. You couldn't see it. You, and, and the utility lied about it. They didn't want to admit that they had a major meltdown. And that caused many more children all over the Northeast to be affected by the radioactive gases that have silently escaped. And nobody died at Three Mile Island, according to the government. At the present time, uh, all those who are involved here who are highly qualified tell me that the reactor core is indeed stable. Criminal charges have been levied by the NRC against the operators at Three Mile Island for forging the test scores of workers because the workers have routinely flunked the exam. It was nothing but one button, the P-O-R-V button, one button that set off a multi-billion dollar accident. The work that I'm best known for is the work that I did on Three Mile Island. And, uh, I didn't go down there after the accident because I knew it was extremely dangerous. One of my colleagues at The Voice, Paul Cowan, did go down there. He died of cancer when he was, I think, 38. I remember when he came into the paper and his hair was quite white and he said, I have, I have cancer. And, I, and uh, when I was down there about five years after the accident, they read a roll call of, I think, 30 reporters who had died who had been there. I went into central Pennsylvania. I interviewed a lot of these people, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, and they were harmed by these so-called safe, low-level doses of radiation. There was a tremendous rise in infant mortality in central Pennsylvania after Three Mile Island. And there was nothing else that could be attributed to than these so-called safe, low-level doses of radiation. I know from my own experience that court cases in this area are always settled out of court because the defendants never want the idea that their low levels of radiation can kill people to come out into the open, so they pay up. It was an outrageous uh, situation. My husband died uh, seven years ago. His diagnosis was cancer of the lungs. They were still denying that um, there was uh, any fallout, but uh, my brother, was in his backyard and uh, he came into the house and he became very nauseated and started to uh, have a vomiting session. And uh, this was um, about, um, I imagine about two hours after the first big cloud came up. About four years later, he died. Now the industry is trying to foist on the public a new generation of nuclear power plants, the high-temperature gas reactor. Unistar Nuclear, which is in line to receive billions in government loan guarantees for the development of the next generation of nuclear power plants. As I read the Wall Street Journal, you and some others are in line now to get some government help and really break through and start producing more nuclear plants. Tell me it's true and how long will it take you to get them going? Well, we did 100 plants in about 25 years before and we can do it again. And with these loan guarantees, uh, we're positioned to actually be one of the first companies to start breaking ground, you know, really in the, in the short period of time, a couple years, and maybe see one up and running by about 2016. 2016. Now, the Wall Street Journal article said seven new reactors are online to do this. First of all, is that a good ballpark number? Because I think we need 100. Uh, we definitely need 100 if we really want to do energy security, if we want to clean up the air for human health reasons, you know, if we want to cut our greenhouse gases. Uh, again, we should double down. We've got 100 now. We should do 100 more. You're going to get political opposition, as you well know. And you're going to have opponents from the green movement and the enviromaniacs, as you well know. Are you optimistic? Are you investing your money? I know you're getting government help, but you've got to put up your own dough. 
Well, remember, these are loan guarantees, so we still have to come up with real private sector backing, and our company is going to do it in a merchant environment. That means in an unregulated environment, so we're very bullish on this. The power industry is trying to present itself as the solution to the climate crisis. That's the latest public relations gimmick that the industry has come up with. And they've been largely effective on Capitol Hill in getting their way because they spend so much money on lobbying. So from 1999 to 2009, the nuclear power industry spent $645 million on lobbying. It's an incredible amount of money. In addition, they spent $64 million on federal campaign contributions. So that has opened doors on Capitol Hill. It's opened doors at the White House in both Republican and Democratic administrations. To create more of these clean energy jobs, we need more production, more efficiency, more incentives. And that means building a new generation of safe, clean nuclear power plants in this country. Uh, nuclear power is the last thing from green. The idea that atomic energy somehow operates in harmony with the planet is uh, a complete non-starter. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Nuclear power is the least green technology ever invented and uh, certainly for generating electricity. Nuclear power does emit greenhouse gases in the mining, milling, and enrichment of fuel, in the management of spent fuel, in the transportation of radioactive wastes. All these things throw greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. The idea that atomic energy is in any way, shape, or form an answer to global warming is completely absurd. And people who argue this have simply not done their homework. Uh, the reality is that nuclear power is a carbon emitter. And, it, and worse than that, nuclear power sucks up the social capital that should otherwise be going to the technologies that really do fight global warming, which is solar, wind, tidal, geothermal, ocean th thermal, and all that stuff. The people that go into the nuclear business, these are not businessmen. These are people who know how to crank the government money machine, the corporate welfare machine. These are not legitimate businesses. They have no idea how to run a legitimate business. They only, only work subsidies, monopoly, political power. They don't produce anything. They have no idea how to produce anything. They have a long history of harassment of workers and fraud. The weak link in a nuclear power plant is not the dome of the reactor that we see in photographs. It's the spent fuel pond that no one even thinks about. We have a lightly guarded swimming pool containing many cores worth of nuclear materials that is subject to a terrorist attack. In the cooling pools of nuclear power plants, there's up to 30 times more radiation than there is in the reactor core. And in the core itself, is as much radiation as the equivalent of a thousand Hiroshima-sized bombs. Terrorists don't need nuclear weapons these days because there are 104 nuclear power plants deployed all over the country. Like those guys who learned to fly airplanes and flew them in the World Trade Towers, there are many ways you can induce meltdowns um, and contaminate an area the size of Pennsylvania, or more, permanently. One of the astonishing revelations of the 9-11 Commission was the fact that the terrorists, in seeking out targets in the New York area, first looked at nuclear installations. They didn't clarify precisely which installations, but we know that it's Indian Point. Indian Point is a commercial nuclear reactor north of Manhattan. It is perhaps the most dangerous commercial machine on the planet Earth. On 9-11-2001, a group of 17 Al-Qaeda terrorists chose to crash their planes into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, killing more than 3,000 people. But had they flown 10 miles further north, they could have just as easily crashed their planes into the Indian Point nuclear facility. o'clock 
terrorists blew a plane through the Indian Point. Class 9 accident at a nuclear power plant. The dome overpressurizes and cracks. Radiation spews out of the dome. By 2 o'clock, the winds are blowing at 10 to 15 miles an hour. Radiation now is going past the evacuation zone. Heaters and detectors will start to go off scale. At 3 o'clock, large portions of Manhattan are now being doused with radiation. But for the most part, people will carry on their normal affairs, not realizing that they've taken a lethal dose of radiation from the Indian Point nuclear power plant. Radiation cannot be felt, it cannot be seen, it cannot be smelled. All you'd notice was a metallic taste in your mouth. You'd all be trapped. Millions and millions and millions of people. One successful hit. No one would get out. 21 million people. All the children in schools will be bussed out on school buses. Since there are not enough buses to make just one trip, the plan is that there will be multiple trips of school buses. But the public is not supposed to know. At 4 o'clock, the governor comes on television to make the announcement that evacuation plans have been made to evacuate people 10 miles from the Indian Point nuclear power plant. Well, sorry about that. Radiation has already soared over Manhattan. The entire logical structure of the plan is fundamentally flawed and not even honest. They don't plan for a terrorist attack because they can't. At 6 o'clock, the President of the United States comes on television to announce that a major terrorist attack has taken place at Indian Point. However, the evacuation plans for New York City are not in place because New York City is outside the evacuation zone. What happens to the people in Manhattan? There's chaos. People don't know which direction the cloud went. There are going to be tens of millions of people fleeing the contaminated areas. Everyone gets into their cars and spontaneously evacuates with or without an emergency evacuation plan. The Long Island Express is the world's largest parking lot. People in the outlying areas are not going to have the social infrastructure. They're not going to have the beds, the foods the, to handle the millions of people that are going to be flooding out of the New York metropolitan area. And they're going to be covered with radiation. At that point, perhaps farmers may pick up shotguns, just like in the 1950s, to keep the New York City slickers out. Within 24 to 48 hours, people would be experiencing severe nausea and start vomiting and developing severe diarrhea, and they would die within days or a week or two of acute radiation sickness, like the way AIDS patients die. New York would be, it would really be a long-term intensive care unit with people all waiting to die. The uh, apologists for nuclear power love to say that we've had no problems here with the reactors here in the United States. It, it's utterly absurd. It, it's basically the blind deceiving the uninformed. <laughs> because the, re the reality is that um, American re atomic energy has been plagued by serious problems right from the get-go. And uh, uh, every one of these reactors in the United States, there are 104 that are uh, currently operating. There are 23 that are virtually identical to Fukushima Unit 1. These reactors have a terrible track record. For example, the Davis-Bessey reactor, which is a, a clone of Three Mile Island, uh, the irresponsibility of the operators of this reactor allowed a boric acid leak to eat almost all the way through the reactor pressure vessel that contains the, the core reaction in a nuclear power plant. Another fraction of an inch, and we could very well have had a Chernobyl uh, on Lake Erie. We also had a meltdown and near explosion at the Fermi-1 nuclear reactor on October 5th, 1966. The authorities were actually contemplating how they would evacuate Detroit when this reactor, which was cooled with liquid sodium, actually could have exploded and put a radioactive crater in southeastern Michigan. We have constant leaks at the Indian Point and Oyster Creek reactors in New York and New Jersey. We have uh, clear problems at reactors on earthquake faults, and I mean very, very close, within a mile of major earthquake faults at Diablo Canyon, California, and San Onofre, California. The Fort St. Ferrand reactor in Colorado was such a bust that the utility finally had to throw in the towel and shut it down forever. Just at the time when we should collectively across the world have put our energies behind authentically renewable energies, 
like solar, like wind, or like local biomass energy, what we saw was a crazy idea of the nuclear renaissance. And this began with the US-India nuclear deal, pushed on India totally undemocratically. Our parliament refused to sign it. Votes were bought, a cash for votes scandal nearly brought down our democracy just to push nuclear power. And there's a frenzy in India of trying to build dozens of new nuclear parks. Even though we have a record of accidents in every one of our older power plants, Tarapur, Haiga, Narela. Um, the biggest power plant of the world is planned in a place called Jaitapur in India. To make such a giant sized nuclear power plant, you have to grab a lot of land. And this area is extremely fertile. The area has extremely strong local democracy. And when the government insisted on appropriating the land, the people said, we won't give our land. The local authorities and local councils rule they will not give the land. And they have under the constitution the right to say no. But they were not listened to. All of our local councils, democratically elected, have resigned in that area. A farmer has been shot dead. Two farmers have been killed in Haryana, where another power plant is being built. So every nuclear power plant that's being built is being built with the cost of land appropriation and land grab, the cost of destruction of democracy, and the cost of violation of human rights. If nuclear power plants and nuclear energy had to go through the test of democracy and human rights, we would not have a single new nuclear power plant. One of the grand myths of nuclear power is that it's cheap. In fact, nuclear power, as far as I can tell, is probably the most expensive form per kilowatt hour. For example, the South Texas project had won US government guarantees because they said they could build these two plants for $5 billion. Toshiba, which we know is Westinghouse, but there is no Westinghouse anymore, knew that the project would cost at least $8 billion when they applied for the US government guarantees. This is an old game in nuclear. They tell you it's $5 billion, then it's $8 billion. By the way, the project latest numbers are $13 billion. But guess what? The US taxpayer is now already on the hook for the money. And for the first time ever, the US government has agreed to pay if a project stops and you never get a dime of the money. I got to tell you that the nuclear industry has spent close to $100 billion on projects that were never completed and never ran for a single day. Uh, the two reactors at Seabrook, New Hampshire, were originally pro uh, projected to cost 250 million total, and they wound up with one reactor there at seven billion. Similar figures at Shoreham, uh, seven billion for a reactor that never even operated. Companies like Halliburton, uh, Stone and Webster Shaw Group, these companies make mints knowing that they will get billion dollar contracts and never actually have to produce anything. That's part of the cost of nuclear power because it's all subsidized in two ways, at least. The number one subsidy is from you, the bill payer. When you turn on your light switch, you are paying not only for the cost of electricity, you're paying for nuclear plant spending, building, planning for plants you will never see. The problem with nuclear power, besides being so one-sided that you never look at the consequences, and you've created a, a technocratic, nucleocratic elite that shuts its eyes to two ends of the nuclear process, the mining end and the managing the spent fuel and the nuclear waste. Uh, mining is a very, very hazardous uh, process for local communities. Uh, we have uranium mines in a tribal area in uh, the state of Jharkhand in a place called Jadukoda. And children are being born crippled, children are being born with deformities, but the nuclear establishment will never look at it. Only the local communities report on it. And there's this very convenient description that that's not science. It's only when the nuclear establishment does a study, it becomes science. But they never do the studies on safety. 
including the safety in the uranium mines. So nuclear power looks very clean if you exclude uranium mining. If you've ever seen a uranium mining operation, it would make you sick. At the Indian reservations in the United States where British Petroleum BP owns uranium mines, they've gone beyond petroleum. You have water contaminated with radiation. You have some serious illnesses caused by uranium mining in the United States. If we expand uranium use, as is now planned, where we now plan to have um, reactors created and fueled by Arriva, the French company. They've turned the African nation of Niger into a uranium colony. It's a place where people are sick of every type of radiation and poisoning that you can imagine. It is not a clean technology. If you live in Niger, you would not consider it clean. Mines there would make King Solomon cry. If all the electricity today was generated by nuclear power, there's only nine years' supply of uranium fuel left in the world. And it's going to do god awful things to future generations. The unsolved problem of radioactive waste has been the Achilles heel of the nuclear industry right from the start. When the first reactor opened, this commercial reactor opened at Shippingport, Pennsylvania in 1957, they had no solution. And they said, oh, well, it, it, science will take care of it. It's right around the corner. They've been saying that since 1957, and there's no corner to be turned. The one place they were thinking of putting all this stuff, Yucca Mountain, uh, Nevada has been abandoned, and for very good reason, by the way. I was in Yucca Mountain, Nevada. It has a visible earthquake fault. If I was a geology teacher, I would take my students to Yucca Mountain, Nevada, to show them what an earthquake fault looks like. It goes right through the mountain. There is an aquifer underneath Yucca Mountain, which is used for irrigating a very vibrant agricultural community downstream. It's also used for drinking water. There's a National Wildlife Refuge, there's a Native American Reservation, and a National Park all downstream. If radioactive waste is ever buried there, there is so much earthquake activity, so much volcanic activity, and so much water flowing through that site, it would become a nuclear sacrifice area downstream. The Obama administration has canceled the Yucca Mountain Project on this geologically unsuitable land that happens to belong to the Western Shoshone Indian Nation. So that's not happening. So in a very real sense, we are back to the beginning. We do not know what we're doing with our radioactive waste. We do not have the funding in place to pay for it. And the wastes continue to pile up at the reactors where they are generated in the first place. Now, at every reactor in the United States, there are spent fuel rods. These spent fuel rods are incredibly dangerous and uniquely toxic. There is nothing else on Earth that can even approach the toxicity, the killing power of these so-called spent uranium fuel rods. And in fact, if you had one of these rods recently removed from a nuclear power plant and stood next to it, you would be dead within a matter of minutes or even less. These things uh, cannot be tolerated by the human body and certainly have no place on this earth. Now what's happened is that at the 104 reactors around the United States, we now have about 60,000 tons of so-called spent fuel which is sitting either in pools that have to be continually circulated with some kind of electric power running pumps or in dry casks. They can go into dry casks after a certain amount of time in these pools. Uh, they lose some of their toxicity, some of their radiation, and they're being put in essentially boxes. They're metal and concrete boxes with ventilation holes. That's all they are. Very susceptible to terrorism, uh, very susceptible to other uh, problems, uh, especially tornadoes and hurricanes. But the reality is that th this is no solution. All this power that we're allegedly dependent on from nuclear power is, is nonsense. It's, it's completely uh, expendable. But there's something called low-level waste. When those workers go in and you see them wear booties and they wear dosimeters and they have hats and gloves, that's irradiated. Where do you think that stuff goes? It goes into dumps in poor areas like Louisiana where uh, BNFL and other companies are dumping low-level waste that's leaching out, that's harming these communities. We don't know how many people are going to die there, but we see this problem, and it's huge in the United States. 
It's huge in Europe. And now it's absolutely devastating, not only in Russia, but in Japan. In 2002, a scandal broke out because Tokyo Electric was found to be cheating on their inspection data. They did all sorts of things, terrible things. For example, government inspectors were there checking the containment, and they would be on the other side of the containment pumping air so that it would make it look like the containment was safe. They were manipulating it on the other side, even as inspectors were there on site uh, testing. For years, for many years, I was an investigator for the government of racketeering and fraud committed by nuclear plant operators and builders. I did several cases, one of them against the builders and operators of the Shoreham nuclear plant. And we discovered systematic fraud and deception from the highest levels of these corporations. And a jury agreed that they had committed conspiracy and racketeering and ordered the company to pay $4 billion. Everybody knows that um, Tokyo Electric and the government are in together um, on these issues. Even that scandal that occurred, what Tokyo Electric got out of it is exactly what it wanted for many years. And that is the government ruled that the inspections were too strict and therefore companies were forced to cheat and therefore the inspection uh, standards should be relaxed. I saw personally the information and we put in court top executives in the industry and engineers who said we were forced to change seismic, that is earthquake proofing on plants from failed to pass. The company that faked the earthquake proofing it was called Stone and Webster. Stone and Webster is the nuclear unit now of Shaw Group. Shaw Group is the, is the company that's designated to build all three of the new nuclear plants planned for the U.S. The guys that faked the earthquake proofing are the guys who are designated to build the plants. In 2006, Toshiba, this huge Japanese corporation, acquired the nuclear division of Westinghouse. Later, a company called Hitachi, a big Japanese corporation as well, went into partnership with General Electric in its nuclear division. Why this is very important is that GE and Westinghouse have been the Coke and Pepsi of nuclear power worldwide for forever, for decades. 80% of nuclear power plants worldwide are of GE or Westinghouse design or manufacture. One of the first two plants that will be built is a South Texas project, units three and four. Because of the questionable background of the companies involved, including the company that the jury found liable for racketeering, Stone and Webster, they brought in a respected operator, they said, to train the workers in how to properly build and properly operate a plant. Tokyo Electric Power, which will own 20%, and is being brought in because of their expertise and the faith that the industry has in them to properly operate and properly build a nuclear plant. Bringing in TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power, was signed um, about nine months prior to Tokyo Electric Power's disaster at Fukushima. Now, what happened at Fukushima is certainly not good for business, and this deep, very deep Japanese corporate involvement in the global nuclear power trade provides an additional incentive for the, the Japanese, uh, the Tokyo Electric folk and the Japanese government officials to, to not tell the truth to their people and to the world about what has happened and what continues to be happening regarding Fukushima. One of the biggest nuclear plant builders was um, Halliburton, its Brown and Root subsidiary. They were involved in the harassment of the workers, faking of the safety documents, lies about the cost of the plant. When I say lies about the cost, they, were, they had an overrun of 1,000%. 1,000%. Can any real company, real industry survive with that? They did. They did pretty well. 
they're back. I just finished an investigation of Shaw Group in Louisiana. They are the number one donor, for example, to the governor of Louisiana, Bobby Jindal. They can buy and sell politicians with our money because we give them billions of dollars in subsidies. And with that billions of dollars in subsidies, they can make Congress get down on its knees and eat out of a dog food bowl. One of the biggest and, and in some ways least well-known subsidy is called the Price-Anderson Act, which was passed in 1959 to basically provide that an insurance for the nuclear power industry. So taxpayers pick up the cost of any nuclear disaster. That law, which was passed in 1959, was reauthorized in 2005 in the Energy Policy Act of 2005. So right now, there's an initial $12.6 billion in disaster costs that any operator of a nuclear reactor would, would bear. And then anything on top of that is borne by the taxpayer. The power companies get to make all the money on selling the power, and taxpayers pick up the cost for any disaster. Three nuclear engineering supervisors at General Electric resigned in the 1970s, Breidenbaugh, Miner, and Hubbard. And media have reported that it had to do with the Mark I and the flaws in the Mark I, and that was part of it. But in testimony before Congress, what the three engineers stated is that they could no longer continue doing something involved in an industry which, as they put it, threatens life on Earth. So yeah, yeah, the Mark I, Mark I has and had flaws, but uh, nuclear power has a bigger flaw. The industry is rife with corruption, rife with fraud, because there's no way to build a safe nuclear plant. The problem of nuclear power is that it's not built on concrete, it's built on lies. What I find as a physician is that the nuclear industry, be they physicists, engineers, or businessmen, have no idea about radiation, the biological effects of radiation or radiation biology. And so they either lie or they confuse the public with, with various facts that they've gleaned but are, are irrelevant. And they don't explain to the public properly what inhaling or eating internal emitters in their food or their air can do to their bodies. When you talk about political power, I would say one of the worst, most incestuous cases of political power and abuse that I saw was with Bill Clinton and the lawyer for the big nuclear company, Entergy, who went under the name Hillary Rodham with the Rose Law Firm. Her big client, was Entergy, which owns now the Indian Point nuclear plant in New York, where Senator Clinton was very reluctant to call for the closure of this obvious danger right near New York City. They basically own the Clinton family. And I saw this when I was working an investigation in Britain, where Entergy, this little company from Arkansas, from Little Rock, Arkansas, bought the entire London electric system because of the connection between Entergy and the Clintons and their influence with the Blair government in Britain. And then Entergy turned around and flipped the London Electric Company for a billion dollar profit in just a few months. Nice. What does Entergy do for the president and for the first lady at the time? If you remember that there was an investigation of her billing records, I never heard anyone say who she was supposedly billing where the billing records were faked. The company was Entergy. Entergy knows if they were deliberately overcharged. And maybe they wanted to be overcharged because it's a way to pay the governor by hiring his wife for doing nothing. They knew it, and they could do what they want. And today, Entergy is at the forefront of the nuclear industry in the US and at the forefront of buying up plants cheap and then getting extensions on the life of these plants, plants that are almost ready to be shut down and should be. They use their political power, they get an extension on the plant, and they get free money, billions of dollars, for extra decades. It's quite a game. President Obama. 
I mean, he, he was highly critical of nuclear power when he was, uh, he was candidate Obama, when he was running for election. And he said that uh, the problem with nuclear power is that these, <laughs> these nuclear plants can blow up and kill people. I mean, he, he knew the situation. It wasn't like an empty-headed George W. Bush. But once in office, just forget about it. I mean, uh, in the wake of Fukushima, there was Obama on the television in a national address saying that we should provide $34 billion in taxpayer-based loan guarantees to build more nuclear plants. Wall Street won't touch nuclear power. So here's our president saying that we should uh, not, only, not only risk our lives, but we should uh, give our money to build these, uh, these, these lethal machines. And the current administration under President Obama, his re-election chief, David Axelrod, worked for Exelon, used to be known as Commonwealth Edison, the biggest nuclear utility in the nation. He's the one that really sold Obama on pushing nuclear power despite a campaign promise not to go ahead with nuclear until we know where we're going to put dispose of the waste. It's like building a building without a toilet. How do you go back on that? Well, let's ask David Axelrod. Rahm Emanuel, between being a congressman and being chief of staff at the Obama White House, he was an investment banker. And he made millions of dollars on this deal, creating the biggest nuclear utility in the United States, a company called Exelon, based out of Chicago. It owns 17 nuclear power plants, 17. Uh, in fact, it's now in the process of acquiring Constellation Energy, and it will become a bigger nuclear utility. Barack Obama's political career has been owned, operated, and defined by Exelon, before, which was previously Commonwealth Edison in Chicago, which has a dozen nuclear plants ringing the city, and which has really been the major force running that city for many, many years. It's no accident now that Rahm Emanuel has come back out of the White House to be the mayor of, of the biggest nuclearized city in the country. He has Rahm Emanuel at the right hand of Obama. On the left hand side, he has Stephen Chu, who is a, a true nuclear believer out of the nuclear establishment, a, a real zealot. In fact, I, I've heard some of these folks at these national nuclear laboratories refer to themselves as nukies. I mean, it's almost a cult. And uh, Stephen Chu is, is very much into that uh, tradition. He absolutely minimizes, in fact, he denies uh, the consequences of radioactivity. He thinks it's, it's something we can live with. So between Chu and Emmanuel and, and Axelrod, uh, President Obama has been boozled. He has been sold a, a, a bill of nuclear beans, and he is as pro-nuclear as any president we've ever had, and what a tragedy. And, uh, and so we, you have people in Congress who are perpetually taking money from the nuclear power industry. We have Duke Power uh, on the brink of giving $10 million to the Democratic National Convention. And so all across the country, these electric power utilities, which are committed to nuclear power, have been buying public opinion. There is a structure of how the real truth about radiation is covered up among government agencies. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission, of course, is the federal agency that licenses reactors. They're the ones that sets the, quote, safe, permissible limits of exposure and continues to uh, license reactors. However, working in, in conjunction with the NRC are the state and local health departments, who, public health departments, who are, in fact, mandated to protect people, the American people, from uh, harmful exposures from radiation and other chemicals. And um, in, in every case, in every state, in every county in which our radiation research group has presented findings, we are rebutted by the local county health department in, in every case. Their standard line is that these levels of radiation coming out of nuclear reactors are low. In fact, so low that they cannot possibly cause human disease. Just weeks after the Fukushima accident, one of the things that this would-be protective agency did was to extend the operating licenses of a number of nuclear plants in the United States, including Vermont Yankee, which is the identical design as the GE Mark I boiling water reactors that they've had at Fukushima 
to 60 years. So what they've been doing, and there's 104 nuclear plants in the U.S., the NRC has already relicensed for 60 years of operation, 63 of these nuclear plants, and it with the nuclear industry is talking about having the nuclear plants be relicensed, all of them, 80 years, but has been uprating them, allowing them to run at 15 and 20 percent more power, running faster, running harder, running longer, absolutely these folks inviting, inviting disaster, inviting catastrophe. Sometimes when we look at the old Atomic Energy Commission or the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, we see the same names coming up over and over again. We have musical chairs within the nuclear industry. Musical chairs, people going from the government to commercial interests to the military and back into the government. Now, Sho Nasu was president of Tokyo Electric for many years and then the chairman of the board of Tokyo Electric. I remember that time then when they held a public comment. 90% of the people wrote in and, and are against this. And the result of that public comment period and all that effort the citizens put in was that they would strengthen the quote unquote education program for students in public schools so that they could be quote unquote educated properly about nuclear power. And the teachers were forced to teach all these material that got dealt out by, you know, Tokyo Electric or the committee. The corporate media in this country is totally in the pocket uh, of the nuclear power industry. The, the industry has spent millions and hundreds of millions, really, to uh, 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 buy airtime, to uh, buy commentators, to buy people who go out and, and are apologists for the industry on the talk shows, the people who wind up sitting across from the anchors and these, and, and all the way from local TV stations to uh, the biggest radio and TV shows. These are all coming from the PR stable uh, of, the, of the corporate nuclear power industry. You have Westinghouse and General Electric owning their own TV networks. Uh, uh, you have Rupert Murdoch, a very, very committed uh, nuclear backer having Fox. Uh, it, it's all lined up to tell the big lie and to get more and more money from the taxpayer. I mean, this is the ultimate irony. And in many ways, atomic energy is just a big scam to skin the taxpayer, pull uh, huge quantities of money out of the federal treasury and throw them down the toilet of massive commercial atomic reactor construction projects. It's been one of the most massive cover-ups in the history of media, in the history of the press. In fact, Goebbels, the Nazi propaganda minister, would look on what has gone down in the last few decades and smile as an example of, 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 of just the most odious use of propaganda uh, so people would not know would not know the facts about nuclear technology. We have these meetings and huge numbers of media come. We've got TV cameras, we've got reporters, and the next day, nothing. I mean, there, maybe there's one tiny article. It's not even in the regional paper in Fukushima. It's not national, it's just small. Uh, it's just outstanding how much um, pressure there is on the media not to report. If we didn't have foreign media here, I mean, we would be totally lost. I mean, we have to have the eyes of the world looking at this. And if the eyes of the world leave, I mean, we are just, you know, back in Japan domestically struggling with this and we won't get anywhere. But I believe that we've been in the middle and we're continuing to head to what will end up in terms of the numbers of people who will die a nuclear holocaust, and here's the New York Times just, just from a journalistic point of view, from the point of view of journalistic ethics and honesty, being utterly outrageous. I mean, here's this big piece about don't worry, no immediate danger, there's just low levels of radioactivity. It's unbelievable. Uh, I mean, for the Times to join with the nuclear Pinocchios of the nuclear establishment, the nuclear industry, and it's utterly outrageous. Look, the nuclear industry talks about low-level radiation, but let's get it straight. The radiation they produce is actually high-level because what happens is 
You may inhale radioactive gases or eat food that's contaminated with, say, cesium-137 or plutonium or radioactive iodine, and those elements go to specific organs in the body. Iodine goes to the thyroid gland at the base of the neck. Cesium-137 goes to muscle. Strontium-90 goes to bone, and plutonium goes to liver, lung, bone, lymph glands, fetus, and testicle, where it can cause cancer of those organs or mutate genes, again, in the eggs and sperm to cause genetic disease in the future generations. Because the body thinks plutonium is iron, across it goes into the developing embryo. Where it can kill a cell, it's going to form the left half of the brain or the right arm, like the drug thalidomide did, which pregnant women took to alleviate morning sickness and their babies were born with no arms or single eyes or whatever. That's called teratogenesis and that's what plutonium does too. So it is a deadly element. Its half-life is 24,400 years, it lasts for half a million years. Dr. Petkow in, in Canada uh, found that low-level radiation uh, harmed the cell membranes and broke down the lipid barrier on the cell membranes and caused the damage. We also, uh, critically, it's, it's very important, the strontium-90 has a half-life of 28 years. And little small amounts really add up to very large amounts, particularly when these chemicals such as strontium-90 are taken into the body or PCBs and DDT and uh, other chemicals that are absorbed into the body, they stay there for decades. Imagine people waking up generations hence that breast milk or radioactive already. The children being born deformed or with genetic disease. Children getting cancer at the age of six instead of 60 like we do now because they've been exposed in utero to radiation. Epidemics of cancer, epidemics of leukemia, epidemics of genetic disease. How dare we? Well, where the nuclear plants are, we are seeing an, a marked increase in cancer in not only in children, but in the elderly as well. Uh, one of the most striking areas is Pottstown, Pennsylvania, which is a gorgeous part of the country. Rolling farmland and beautiful homes. And we find that since 1981, when the Limerick plant went online in 1998, that the childhood cancer rate has gone up 71%. That's in children between newborns and age 14. There is a fundamental difference between internal and external radiation. External radiation bathes the whole body and every cell in the body gets the same amount of radiation. And since radiation is measured in terms of energy per unit mass, that energy is the same for every single cell in the body. But if I were to take in a particle which was highly radioactive, then I would get a very, very big dose to one part of my body and no dose to the rest of my body. So an example uh, in terms of sitting in front of a fire and warming yourself or eating a hot coal is very appropriate. In the one case, you get a certain amount of heat which warms your body quite pleasantly. In the other case, the same amount of energy is transferred to your body, but it's transferred in the form of a single hot coal, which of course burns a hole in your stomach and kills you. If you have a radioactive source and it's outside your body, the thing that's going to be harmful to you most immediately is going to be the radionuclide that's giving off the gamma. Why? Because gamma travels farther and it goes through heavier material. Tritium actually goes into water, so it's very hard to filter out. You can't filter water from water, and tritium is hydrogen, but it's radioactive hydrogen. So you got your water molecule, which is two hydrogens and one oxygen. Tritium replaces one of those hydrogens. So what ends up happening is you actually have not something dissolved in water, not something you can filter out, not something traveling along with the water, but something that is the water, that is radioactive. We know that the health impacts of low-level radiation are uh, tangible, they are real, they have been monitored uh, despite the best interests of the government and industry to protect them from being monitored. Probably the ultimate case and the one that uh, stands most clear in the history of our um, uh, courtship or our plague with uh, low-level radiation has to do with medical x-rays. 
In the 1950s, uh, Alice Stewart, uh, one of the first female medical doctors in Great Britain, very innocently undertook a study on childhood leukemia. She wanted to know what was causing childhood leukemia in Great Britain, and she put a number of variables into the hopper, and what came out was medical x-rays. She came to the definitive conclusion in the 1950s that the, you do not want to x-ray pregnant women. Dr. Stewart concluded that the most likely cause of childhood leukemia was allowing pregnant women to be x-rayed. When she rather innocently published her findings, the medical profession swooped down on her as if she were some kind of bomb-throwing communist and just totally attacked her personally, attacked her reputation, dismissed her findings. And for 30 years, there was pitched debate over this critical source of low-level radiation, the, uh, the use of medical x-rays on pregnant women. It was true that as time went on, I, uh, I, I've become aware that the objections that were raised against us became sillier and sillier. But the fact that they did continue to be raised against us was a very good thing, because we would never have discovered the later things. Finally, after 30 years, quietly the medical profession threw in the towel and said, you know, we really shouldn't x-ray pregnant women. And to this day, of course, not only don't we x-ray pregnant women, but now people are careful in the dentist's office, and the use of medical x-rays uh, has undergone a revolution. That is our first and our definitive uh, encounter with low-level radiation. There has been an extremely false division made between nuclear power and nuclear weapons. But every nuclear power plant is a system of generating material for nuclear weapons. New uranium reactors end up generating plutonium, which is perfect for making nuclear weapons. And there is no way you can keep these two applications separate. It is therefore important to not just assess nuclear energy for the risks of the plant itself, as we've seen in Fukushima, for the mining and the costs of destruction of democracy, for imposing mining of indigenous people, for the safety and management, which has not been accomplished yet, of the waste, but worse still, that what is the waste of a nuclear power plant is the material for a nuclear plant. There's no law of physics preventing a commercial facility being turned into a weapons facility. That separation is in the minds of bureaucrats. They have the same nuclear fuel cycle. They have the same processing, the same mining, milling, and enrichment of uranium, and they share the same waste facilities. Even the people who run the plants, we're talking about Exxon Nuclear, for example, that is heavily in, of course, oil as well as nuclear energy. We're talking about the same companies, the same individuals that operate one and operate the other. Now, in Iraq, where they're using shells made of uranium-238, the uranium-238 is like plutonium and alpha emitter, and alpha particles are very carcinogenic. If made into a compact shell, it's much better than lead because it's much more dense. And if you hit a tank with a uranium shell, it penetrates into the tank and cuts through like a hot knife through butter. In Basra, in 1991, in the first invasion by America into Iraq, they used 360 or 370 tonnes of this ordnance and much of it's lying around the desert floor in powdered form. The children play in tanks which have been destroyed and are radioactive and they can inhale this stuff. The children play in the dirt and they inhale the radioactive material. The dust storms which occur frequently, sandstorms in that area of the world, blow the stuff up and people inhale it. Now soon after the doctors in the hospital, especially paediatricians, noticed an increased incidence of childhood cancer and leukaemia. And the obstetricians started to see an increase in the number of very, very deformed babies being born. So the incidence of cancer in children has gone up enormously in Basra and the incidence of severe congenital anomalies. Babies being born with no brains or single eyes or no arms has also gone up 700%. So women are too terrified to deliver their babies. 
The half-life of uranium-238 is 4.5 billion years. So what America is conducting is a nuclear war in the cradle of civilization. This is a war crime beyond belief because it will be creating cancer for the rest of time. Now, in this present invasion in Iraq, they've used over 2,000 tonnes, according to most sources. The Pentagon won't reveal how much. They're using it all over the place. And it's really wicked. What we see with nuclear power is that all the time, whether you have an accident or not, these power stations are releasing materials which can go inside your body invisibly and kill you. And in fact, the increase in cancer in the last 50 years following the weapons fallout is a prime example of how testing in the atmosphere by the superpowers has resulted in the release to the biosphere of all these substances which are killing us. And in not only just killing us from cancer, but also increased infertility, reducing sperm counts, do you know that as a result of depleted uranium, some studies in, the, in Israel have shown that there's such a reduction in the sperm count in Israeli men in Jerusalem that if it continues at this rate by the year 2020, there will be no more Israelis at all. They will be infertile, and that will be the end of Israel. And this is a result of the exposure to depleted uranium, which is floating around the Middle East, and actually not only the Middle East, but the whole planet. When the satellites first went up, uh, the concept was, and this was a, a partnership between, uh, well, NASA at that point and the Atomic Energy Commission, to energize satellites with plutonium, the most dangerous of all radioactive substances. Uh, in 1964, however, one of these satellites, the SNAP-9A, didn't make it into orbit, <laughs> fell back to Earth, disintegrated, and the plutonium on it, several pounds of it, scattered, it vaporized and scattered all over the Earth. Several decades ago, Cosmos 954, a Soviet satellite, was also turned on and out of space. It lost altitude, and it plunged into Canada. Thank God it did not hit a populated area, or there would have been a catastrophe beyond comprehension. 100 pounds of highly enriched uranium plowed into the Northwest Territories of Canada on Cosmos 954. The reactor broke up on impact, disintegrated, and spewed radiation over a distance of 100 miles. Now uh, what the Obama administration would like to see is plutonium-238 for space use. SNAP-9A was one of several accidents, three that the U.S. has had with nu space nuclear devices. The Soviets, now Russia, they've, they've had six six accidents. They've done about 60, 60 some odd space nuclear launches. Insane to use nuclear material above our heads uh, when it could, I mean, Newton's law of gravity is still operable. If we were to nuclearize out of space and develop anti-satellite, anti-missile capabilities, who is the most vulnerable to killer satellite technology? We are. We have the most communication satellites. We have the most weather satellites. We're heavily dependent upon communication satellites. One small hydrogen bomb in space would cause enormous havoc to the entire communications, military, and commercial sectors of this country by blinding us in the middle of a fight. We are the most vulnerable if we begin the process of nuclearizing and weaponizing outer space. Admiral Hyman Rickover He's considered the father of the nuclear navy, as well as uh, the person in charge of the construction of the first commercial nuclear plant built in the United States. In 1982, Rickover retired from the navy and gave a farewell address to a committee of Congress, in which he stated that billions of years ago, two billion years ago, he said there was so much naturally occurring radioactivity on Earth that there just couldn't be any life. Then, as these, as these radioactive poisons went through their, their half-lives, their hazardous lifetimes, then, said Rickover, life could begin. And now, Rickover went on, by splitting the atom, by doing fission, by having these nuclear reactors, these nuclear power plants, we are recreating the poisons that precluded life from existing. And there, said Rickover, 
the human race is going to wreck itself. Now, this is Rickover, not Greenpeace. And then he went on to say, we must outlaw nuclear reactors. At this time, we are clearly in a range where renewable energy is cheaper than atomic energy, and it certainly does serve the environment better in terms of global warming and, and everything else you can imagine. Of course, as we know, solar panels do not emit radiation. We are not going to be scrambling to save ourselves uh, from radioactive fuel at windmills. And uh, you know, biofuels, if properly done, not using food crops, can supplant baseload power all over the world. When you put the total ocean energy potential together, offshore wave, offshore solar platforms, geothermal offshore, salient gradation offshore, when you put all that together, it totals to something like 400 terawatts of potential, which is 28 times the world's current energy consumption. This question of if we don't need as much energy as we've got now, then we could actually stop tomorrow. We don't need any more extra energy. We can survive as, on what we have now. If, if, if we stop manufacturing stuff we didn't need, if we had proper public transport systems, if we had proper efficiency in, in all of the areas where we employ energy, and we had a, pro a proper economic system where people didn't have to work all the time, you know, using energy and making energy and wasting energy, then there would be no problem. We could take all the nuclear power stations and just get rid of them now, tomorrow. Based on the studies uh, and based on our very, very solid uh, uh, scientific information base, it is 100% certain that if we could magically subtract all the nuclear, coal, oil, and gas from this world and uh, simply install available technology with solar, wind, tidal, geothermal, all that stuff, the lights wouldn't blink. The technology is there. The, the resources are there. We have all the sunlight, all the wind, all the uh, geothermal and ocean thermal and wave energy we need to run this planet with available technology. What's standing in the way is the uh, corporate investments in, in nuclear power and, uh, and fossil fuels. And, and that's really the ultimate threat to humankind. And, uh, you know, somebody has had a lot of fun portraying uh, atomic energy as green, but uh, never has a bigger lie been told. Mark my words, Fukushima means the end of nuclear power in the world and I hope there will be ongoing ramifications so that people understand that nuclear weapons are medically contraindicated to and we'll get rid of them once and for all. The public has had a huge impact on the nuclear power industry. Uh, people get hopeless sometimes, but hopelessness is a corporate asset. We need to understand that if people had not risen up against nuclear power plants, well before Three Mile Island, I might add, I helped coin the phrase no nukes in 1973. We were fighting a local nuclear power plant in western Massachusetts against all odds. Everybody told us we could not stop these people. We stopped that nuclear plant. Where they were going to build it is now a nature conservancy. In 1974, Richard Nixon said there would be a thousand nuclear plants in the United States by the year 2000 and there are 104, and, and now that's way too many. But the way we stopped atomic power in this country from getting an additional 900 or so reactors is by preventing the federal government from financing these plants. But number one was the reality that the No Nukes movement got together, had a vision of a solar utopian future with green power, and said we don't want nuclear power, we do want true green energy, and we are willing to go out and demonstrate and lobby and do whatever it takes within the nonviolent framework to stop these reactors from being built. And by God, we did it. And if you can imagine this country with a thousand nuclear plants, it's a nightmare that we avoided only because see, people went out and worked and prevented them from getting federal money and other permits and whatever else they thought they needed to build these additional 900 reactors. Now with this Fukushima disaster, which comes on the heels of Chernobyl and Three Mile Island and so much else. People are saying, well, the government's for it and so on and so forth. We can stop this industry. We can get these $36 billion out. We can prevent these reactors one by one from being built. And we can install all the renewable features that we need to survive on this planet. And that is our mandate. And I think we will do it. In the ultimate battle between the profit motive and the survival instinct, I think the survival instinct will win, and we have a duty to make sure it does. All the research that we have done 
and that people all over the world have done in the last few decades. That the greatest single environmental factor that has been ignored has been bomb fallout and nuclear radiation from permitted releases from nuclear accidents. And if we continue this emission from 100 nuclear plants in this country and affect the mental and physical ability of our children, then we are destroying the future of our nation. We are destroying the very building blocks of life, our precious DNA by increasing the background level of radiation from nuclear power and nuclear weapons. We, this generation, are the curators of life on Earth. We hold it in the palm of our hands, and we're determining whether or not it lives or dies. That means leading with our souls and our guts to make sure that our children have a safe future. We're here as beautiful human beings with beautiful souls with which we were born. The purity and the wisdom you see in the baby's eyes when the baby's born. Harness that beauty, harness that wisdom, and use it with a passion, knowing that we are, in fact, maybe the curators of the only life in the universe. We see now, all too clearly, atomic technology is at war with our Earth's ecosystems. Its centralized corporate nature puts democracy itself at risk. It jeopardizes the very survival of life on this planet. With all the alternative forms of real clean energy, it seems senseless that we still rely on an archaic form of energy that jeopardizes the lives of tens of millions just to continue to line the pockets of a few. If people around the world can keep up the pressure and bring about the green energy revolution, we will see the end of the nuclear power industry. Let's rise up and stop them.